Praise the Lord. He is great. Amen. Our music team do a great job. Praise the Lord. We praise the Lord for them and all that they do to lead us into worship. I had a text from uh, Brother Joe yesterday. Just wanted to, for me to thank you from the team uh, about how uh, your prayers were answered. The pastor's conference in Belize was a great success. He said it was the best one ever. And uh, they just had revival and God just showed up and uh, just did a great work. And he wanted me to thank you for your prayers and all that happened. Just be praying for their safe return as the team will be uh, traveling at various times coming back. So again, praise the Lord for that good report. Well, as pastors, we were always trying to motivate and instruct and give uh, heed warnings about various things that will happen to the flock. And uh, sometimes it's frustrating that when you try to make a point, maybe, and the, uh, the sheep don't follow the instruction of the word, you try to come up with all kind of ways. You may be like the one pastor who uh, decided he was gonna come up with something different and believed his congregation really needed to hear a word on self-control and he kept trying to preach it and preach it and seemed like the self-control wasn't happening. So what he did, he decided to take one of his children's church sermons out and see if he could get to them that way. And so what he did, he set up on the podium four jars and he had one jar of beer, he had one jar of cigarette smoke, he had one jar of chocolate and he had one jar of fresh, nice topsoil. And he dropped a little worm in each of the containers. And he told the congregation, he said, do you notice the worm that's in the beer? He's dead. The worm that's in the cigarette smoke now is dead. The worm that's in the chocolate is dead. The worm that's in the fresh topsoil is alive, thriving, free, liberated, and living a great life. Does anybody know what the moral of this lesson in is? Well, 90-year-old Miss Jones in the back raised her hand and says, I know, said if you drink beer, you smoke, and you eat chocolate, you'll never get worms. <laughs> Sometimes the congregation just doesn't get the message of what is trying to be portrayed. Well, this morning I hope you get the message how to get a blessing and what to do with it. And I know some of you are saying, you know, Pastor Tim, you can go ahead and preach that first part on how to get the blessing, but you can really let us out early because if we're too dumb to know what to do with the blessing, we just ought not be here. We know what to do with the blessing. There's just two words, enjoy it. <laughs> go to the next point, you know what I mean? So let us out early, just do the first part, but hopefully we won't be like Miss Jones in that. And really, we may end up missing the whole message by knowing what to do with the blessing that God gives us. And so today we are looking at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, as we look at this blessing that Peter got, as well as his colleagues. We see point number one in getting the blessing is, let Jesus in your business and let him use what you have. It says, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, that's Jesus, and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of the Gazaret, which is really another name for the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he, Jesus, got into one of the boat, which was Simon's, which we know that was Peter's name before his name was changed, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So here's the scenario. Jesus wants to preach to the crowd. And just like we set up a church platform and a podium just a little bit away from the congregation so that you can see and hear clearly, Jesus had the same scenario. The people were crowding in and the people couldn't see him or hear him. So he decided to get in one of their boats go out just a little, being that the boat was on top of the water, it was elevated, and then he was elevated being on top of the boat, so it made an excellent podium for him to teach to the people. So it was a great benefit to his teaching. But the kicker is, he needed a boat. And Peter had a boat. 
and he led him in his business. You see, Peter's business, along with some other ones, matter of fact, they, we, most people believe seven of the 12 disciples were fishermen. So this was their profession, Peter and several of the others that were there. This is what they did for a living. This was their business, and I believe their business represented their life at that time. And so you've heard the scenario, you've heard the phrase, don't get all up in my business. Or that's, I've even had people, I read in a counseling session, somebody said, well, that's none of your business. I'm thinking like, well, why are you here then? You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, you've come here for me to be part of your business. That, you know, people say, don't get in my business. Now you would never say that to God, but many people live that way to God. Don't get into that part of my business. <laughs> that's my business. Uh, you got some stuff I'll let you in. I mean, you can have this and this and this of my life or business, but this is my business here. And that's what Peter, this was his business, but he let Jesus in his business, not in just his occupation. He let him in all aspects of his business. And he let him use what he had. If I got a boat, you can have the boat. If I use a boat, you can use a boat. If I need the boat right now, it's your boat, not my boat. And so he let him in his business. You see, if there's an area of your life or, so to speak, getting in your business that you hadn't let God got in, get in your business in that area, your business, whatever that aspect of your life, is going to start failing if it hadn't already failed already. You see, we let Jesus take part of it, but maybe not all of it. And so we see that Jesus and Simon are now connected by being in the same boat, the same business, so to speak. Dr. Herbert Jackson was a missionary and ended up going and teaching in seminary and was teaching a class of missions to seminary students. And he was telling the story that when he was a missionary, he had a vehicle that the missions had given him to use so that he could go out and mission out in the villages and wherever else he went. But he had, in order for this vehicle to crank, he had to have his students push him. And so they would all push him every morning. The car, he'd let the clutch out, it would crank. And then every village that he would stop, he would always park where it was on an incline so that when he got into it, he could let out the brake and it would roll enough so he could pop the clutch and crank it. And that's how he did for all the years that he was in missionary work. Well, it's time for him to retire or to stop that mission work and so the new replacement was brought in and he showed him the villages and what he did and what the task would be for the new missionary that would take his place. And he said, oh yeah, by the way, let me show you the trick that I've learned. He was so proud of himself that he had learned the trick to get this car going. And so he showed the new person that. And the new missionary popped the hood up and looked for a minute and took his hand for about two seconds and closed the hood, went and cranked the car. Vroom, off it went missionary was baffled. He said, well, how'd you do that? He said, you just had a wire that wasn't connected. All those years, all those students pushing, all those times he had to find a place to park that was on an incline were not necessary. He just wasn't fully connected. You see, if Jesus isn't all connected in your business, you're not only not going to start up, you're not going to go anywhere. This is how Peter started out this blessing. This blessing would have never occurred had he not let Jesus into his life, so to speak, into the affairs that meant the most to him, which was obviously his boat and his business. So the business symbolized his life and now Jesus is in it. The second thing is don't try to reason out what Jesus asked of you. It says here, when he had finished speaking, in other words, he's through with his sermon now, Jesus said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now you think, well, simple enough. Well, it's really not simple enough. These men had been fishing all night long because that's when you fish in the Sea of Galilee. And that's when you catch fish because at nighttime, it's cooler, the fish come into shallow waters, waters and the only way you're catching the fish is to throw a net and the net will only go down so far 
and you pull in the fish. Two things you never do as a fisherman is fish during the day and fish especially deep because the fish are down low during the warm part of the day and a net's not going to go down that far. So you're thinking, well, what do I do? Well, we do like Peter and we come up with our own little rationale. So Simon answered and said, Master, we have worked all night long and caught nothing. Zero, nada, we hadn't caught a fish. And we've been fishing when you're supposed to, where you're supposed to, when you're a professional like moi. <laughs> and he said, basically in his spirit, he's saying, look, I'm a professional fisherman. That's what I do for a living. I mean, that's how you learned it. His father was probably a fisherman. His grandfather was a fisherman. His great-grandfather was a fisherman. That's how you learned your trade when you were in this type of society. You picked up the business from your relatives. And so this is what he's done since he's been a little boy, and he knows how to fish. If there was a Galilee fishing tournament, Peter would have won it. I believe Peter, if he'd have fully been speaking what he was thinking, would have said this. Now, Jesus... If we need a healing, you're our man. If we need a sermon preached, you're the guy we're going to call on. If, if we need something taught out of the Bible that we don't understand, you're the man for the job. If we need somebody that's blind to be made sightful, then you're the guy we're going to pick up the phone and call. Matter of fact, we may even stretch it to if we need some carpentry work done. Because we know Joseph is a carpenter and you raised in the son of a, as the son of a carpenter. We have a carpenter question, we may even throw that at you. But fishing, I'll leave that to the pros. Obviously, you don't know anything about fishing because you just told us two things that no fisherman would ever do, deep and day. You do shallow and night. And he could have easily, now as we laugh at him, how many things have you read in this that you don't do? Tithe, brother, let's rationalize that. Let's, let's, uh, serve, uh, wait, let me rationalize that. Uh, how many things have we rationalized ourselves out of what he said and said, uh, faithfulness? Uh, yeah, they, and we just come up with a little reason, don't we? And when you reason it out, reason it out, it all makes sense to you and it eases your conscience, doesn't it? Because you told the Lord your reason, your reasonings of why you do and why I do what I do. And Peter came so close, I believe, to not getting this blessing because he used this instead of sheer obedience to the Lord. But the first word is but. But I will do as you say and let down those nets. See, as much as he is rationalizing it, as much as he was about to say, I'm not going to do it, he went ahead and did it. And in the Christian life, if you don't, and if I rationalize everything that I'm going to do based on my reasonings, then I'm going to miss God. Some things... A lot of things just don't make sense. But it's what God wants. And that's what you do. You can rationalize yourself out of every blessing in this book. You can rationalize every decision that God wants you to do and say, well, this and this and this and this and this. The Bible talks about being like a child in childlike faith. You know, you heard about the guy who was hiking on a cliff and he slipped and fell. This was a thousand foot bluff. And he was falling, falling, falling and he grabbed a limb. He couldn't even look down. He knew he had a thousand feet down there and he was hanging on for dear life. And he hollered at the top of the precipice, help me, help me. And he heard a voice from the top of the precipice say, I'm here, I'll help you. And he said, I need help, help. And he said, well, do you believe I can help you? And the man holding on the limb said, yes, I believe it. He said, you believe I can help you? He said, yeah, I believe you can help me. He said, you believe I love you enough to help me? He said, I don't even know who you are up there, but yes, I believe you love me enough to help me. Well, the man looking from the top could see that there was a five foot below the man, there was a little level spot where he could fall and then walk off the mountain. 
So the man, the man couldn't see that because he was hanging on the limb. He thought he had a thousand foot fall to make. So the man said, okay, listen to me. Let go. There was a long period of silence and the man looked up. Is there anybody else up there that can help me? <laughs> you know, that's usually what people do. If what God tells them to do, they'll find somebody that'll tell them what they want to hear. If their conscience already doesn't tell them otherwise. You see, he already told him what he wanted to do. And you know what Jesus was about to do? He was about to call a fish conference. All those fish that were way out there, way deep, I must, he must have just said, hey boys, come over here. Come up to the top. And he's got the right to do that because he's God. And he can do whatever he wants if we listen to him. But you know what we got to do? We got to do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Overthrowing reasonings. If you've got reasonings of why you're not doing what God wants you to do, then you've got to overthrow those. And every high thing that lifts itself against the knowledge of God and leading captive every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now some people just think, you know, Brother Tim, I want to be saved long enough and get mature long enough to where all of my thoughts are just going to be God's ways. Well, good luck on that. We're always going to have thoughts that bombard our minds because the devil's always going to give us these thoughts that are rational, reasonable, and logical, and we miss God 110%. What do we have to do then? Well, Paul wrote it right here. He didn't say get mature enough to not have unreasonable thoughts. He's saying take those reasonable thoughts, those things that are against the Word of God, and you take that bad boy and you put him in prison and say, you're going to stay there because I'm going to think God's thoughts and I'm going to do what God says here. And I don't care what my reasons think and what my logic thinks. I'm going to do what God says. Yeah, but that doesn't sound like the right thing to do. I don't care what the right thing sounds like to do. This is what God wants me to do. This is what his word tells me to do and this is what he tells me to do. And so therefore, I'm going to be obedient by taking those thoughts captive. If Peter wouldn't have took his thoughts captive, we'd have never saw that word, but I will do as you say. This doesn't make sense. I feel like I've got enough wisdom to make the right choice, but since you're telling me to do it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to do what you say. Because then Peter found out that he realized the reward for obedience. It says in verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break so that they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to break. Do you realize that these fishermen's nets were engineered for catching fish? And their boats were engineered to carry fish. But this was such a large miracle. Their nets couldn't handle it and their boats couldn't handle it. It was just too much. You know what? I think Jesus knew what he was talking about. He baffled the fishing pros. Everybody thought that they knew better. It seemed like Jesus always knows better. I've never met a person say, you know, Brother Tim, I did it God's way and wish I wouldn't have. <laughs> Sure wish I wouldn't have done it God's way. Oh, but I've heard people say, Oh, Brother Tim, I did it my own way so long and I have really messed things up. <laughs> and we wonder why we don't do it all God's way when it always works out like that. Because God's never been proven wrong once. And he never will be. And so here he is. They've got such a great catch of fish that they're just busting at the seams. But what a great picture of the church. Some have even said it's a picture of the church because they started out right by the shore. Remember he said cast out a little and then, it, then he said cast out to the deep. Isn't that what he told them when he sent them out? Go out into Jerusalem first, in that close part, and then go out into the world, out into the deep. 
Another reason I believe it's a picture of the church is, look what it says, it's someone to call on, somebody to call on for help. It says they signaled to their partners to come and help them. They had some partners to come. Matter of fact, in verse 10, you can see this word partners that he uses in verse 10 is kononos, which is akin to the word koinonia, which is where we get the word fellowship, the church. Y'all do know you're members of Believer's Fellowship. That's part of its name because the fellowship is the church. And here's the, the word right there, koinonia, that kin to that word. It, it was, they were partners. We're partners. We're the church. And praise the Lord that we have people that we can signal to for help. You know what pride says is, I got it on my own. I'm saved, I, I know the Bible, I, I, I got it on my own. Well, good luck to you. That never has worked for me. Because God's always put me in a place where I need others. And he's never called us to do this Christian life by ourselves. He gave us, and I believe the scenario is, if Peter's business is our life, the boat is the church. And he had people that he could call upon, partners in other boats, to come help him. We need help. We need prayer. We need support. We need encouragement. And if you're not in a boat, then you may feel like you're sinking. Because God's all given us a boat to be part of. And then we have someone to share the burdens and blessings. What does it say? It said they filled both of the boats. So you can share your blessings and your burdens when you're in a church, when you're in the boat, because the boat's there. And so not only were they able to have enough for them, they could share the blessing. You see, as we're all in the church using our gifts that God's given us, we bless one another. There's people in here with the gift of encouragement, people in the gifts of teaching, people with the gifts of giving, and on and on and on to where each other is blessing each other. A lot of times people don't have the blessing because they're not tied into the church and they're not part of a church. You know, there's really three groups of people. There's church orphans. You know who church orphans are? That's people that don't even have a church family because they're a church orphan. Then there's church foster kids. They go from church to church to church to church to church to church and never stop and say, I need to be part of a church family. And they're looking maybe for to be adopted, but they spend all their life in foster home when God has a church family for them. And there's no reason they can't go from foster orphan, I mean from church orphan to church foster kid to finally, I'm a member of a family. I'm loved and I can love others. Oh, how good it is to be in a family. And here, this scenario, this picture is such a beautiful picture of the church. It's a good picture too is if the boat's the church, then the water's the world that's where he ends up saying, go catch some men, some fish, because we get the fish out of the world. But if you've ever owned a boat, it's okay to have your boat on water. It's not okay to have water in your boat. And today's church is letting their water in their boat. Let's be like them, so let's let it in us. And that's why the church of today is sinking, because the water has come in the church boat. And then the last ill is never forget the purpose of a blessing. You see, this blessing was really twofold. The blessing was not just the fish, but the lesson learned from the situation. A lot of people just simply say, well, the blessing, that's just, woo, all that fish. I mean, they're fishermen and they didn't catch anything, so their income last night was terrible, and now they got a boatload. Literally, a boatload. Well, what do and what should we do when blessings come our way? I think the first one is your blessing should lead to a sensitive self-examination resulting in a closer walk with Jesus. Every blessing, every situation should end up having that scenario. Here's what that next verse said. But Peter, Simon Peter, saw that. Saw what? 
saw all these fish. That boat's sinking, my boat's sinking, we got more fish we ought to do with, our nets have broke. I mean, this is a catch like no other catch ever. We got more fish than we know what to do with. Now let's be honest. If it had your name and my name in there, and that just happened, would the next verse say this? And our name, we got out our Galilean calculator. And we said, hmm, 10,000 fish. Price at the Galilean market is 13 shekels a pound. Wow. And then we would say, praise the Lord. And then go on. I mean, isn't that what you're supposed to do with the blessing? I mean, calculate it. See how much money you're going to have in the bank because God poured out that blessing on you. Say, praise the Lord and go on. I mean, isn't that what should happen here? I mean, that's it. I mean, we would all tend to do that and say, thank you, Lord, for this blessing. Then why on earth is this the next verse? And he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, go away from me, Lord. Excuse me? I am a sinful man. Wait, something happened here. Did, did we miss something? I don't see anything about the calculator. I don't see anything about how many fish, how much money they'd be in the bank, and I praise the Lord. All I see is get away from me. Get away, Lord. I am a sinful man, and he falls on his feet. I don't know if that's how we responded the last time we got a blessing. But that blessing, he looked around and saw it, and I think he must have thought several things. First thing he thought, I'm sure, was he's God. Second thing he probably thought in my mind was how stupid and selfish I was by doubting him to start with. Thinking that my rules of fishing were going to trump his, that I almost reasoned myself out of a blessing. He was also probably thinking, you know what? Because of what I see now in my life, I can't have a close relationship with him because I've got sin in my life. I've got things that are going to hinder me from being close to him. So since we're in a boat, I need to get him to get away from me because he knew that to have a close relationship with him, it would require being right and not sinful. You know, a lot of times we don't do this because we do just the opposite. If we don't believe we measure up to the standard, we change the standard. You know, if you didn't change your clocks the last time we had a time change, you just sim simply said, I'm not going to change them. <laughs> and then everywhere you go, people say, you're not on time. And you said, oh yes, I am on time. I'm right on time. They said, no, you're not on time. And we couldn't convince you that you're not on time because you're on a whole different standard than what you're supposed to be on. See, when God sets the standard and we look into this mirror of the standard, we begin to see things in a much different light. Some people are under the assumption that, you know, the more I grow in the Lord, the more I'm going to see how holy and righteous I am. You know, I think sometimes it's just the opposite of that. I think sometimes the more we grow, the more sinful we see we are. You know, if you've reached a thought, say, you know, I'm, I'm getting on up there. I'm learning a lot of verses. I've been a Christian a long time. We become judgmental, acoustic, righteous, holier-than-thou righteousness. But you know, if we really look in the mirror of His Word which that's what James says his word is, is like a mirror. Do you know the only way you can see your face is in a mirror? I can tell if my hands are dirty and then go wash them. I can tell if my feet are dirty and take care of that. But I have no idea what my face looks like unless I go to a mirror 
That's why the Bible in James says this is basically the mirror. Because if I don't have a mirror, I tend to believe I must look all right. Matter of fact, there was a missionary once who took a mirror and was going to give it to a native who had never seen a mirror before. And in their own language, the missionary described what he was giving her before he handed it to her. That this was a mirror and she could see herself and she had never held a mirror in her hand. And she, be, she looked in a mirror for the very first time and she took it and threw it down and broke it into pieces because she didn't like what she saw. You see, that's how we do sometimes with the word of the Lord. Instead of getting right, we just throw this away and get less committed, a little more distance because we didn't like what we saw. We didn't like what we heard preached. We didn't like what we heard convicted. And so we just do like she does and say, that's the truth and I don't like it and break it. You know, one time for a Christmas gift, Rebecca had me buy her one of these mirrors and this bad boy's got some lights all the way around this thing. I mean, it's illuminated. So it's not only a mirror, it's an illuminated mirror. And what you never want, or at least I don't ever want to do, if you flip that bad boy this way, oh my goodness, oh, that's scary when I look at it. I mean, I don't look too good this way, but boy, when I look at it, man, it'll magnify. I mean, you can see a Z at 400 miles away. I mean, this thing, <laughs> this stuff is bad news, you know, so it doesn't take me long to flip that back up there like that. But you see, women want to look their best. And so they not only want a mirror to see, they want a lit mirror to see, and they'll even flip that thing over to have magnification. And they don't get depressed about it. They just do what ladies do to make things. Oh, I know I'm getting in trouble with this. I, I mean, <laughs> Jimmy, you don't come finish up for me right there. <laughs> They have all this stuff they buy at the store that just takes care of all that. Is that got out of that one? All right. So, so they have these things that you can purchase, and then when they get through, voila, perfection. But why don't we do that with God's Word? He doesn't show us what He shows us that we can't change. We just flip, what we do is flip it that way. We just turn it upside down and don't want to hear it. But what He wants us to do is to see it and say, here's what you can do to change. It's not a conviction that he's against us. It's what, that he really wants to show us so that he can. And that's exactly what Peter did. Peter said, man, I'm a sinful man. I, I want to be close to you. And so what happened in his blessing was, and in the lesson was, he was able to change and be better and be a better person. Did you notice this? That in verse 4 he called him master, but now in verse 8 he calls him Lord. You're in charge of this whole thing. You're the Lord over it. Have we really made the Lord Lord over everything? Is he really Lord? That means he calls all the shots from now on. We did with Peter. He became Lord, not just Master, but Lord. And then your blessing should lead to a greater commitment to follow and to serve. For amazement seized him. Remember, he was a fisherman. Whoa. And all of his companions, because of the catch of fish that they had taken, Peter and all of them were just amazed. Now, if you amaze a fisherman, this must have been the best catch ever in their life. Of course, we covered the first part of 10 earlier, and then it says, And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, for now on you will catch men. You're going to do just like you did before. You're going to go out into the world of water, the water of the world. But instead of catching fish and putting them in your boat, you're going to catch souls that get saved. You're going to bring them into the boat of the church, disciple them and take care of them so that they'll be all that I've called them to be. They'll be disciples. They'll end up on their journey in the boat, on their way to heaven, being used by me to catch other folks and to disciple other folks. You're going to do just what you're doing now, but in a different way. Isn't it amazing he called fishermen, people with patience, endurance, steadfastness, and able to go where fish are and bring fish in a boat. You see, he knew he couldn't do it on his own. That's why we have a boat. We have the church. 
you think, well, what did that lead to? The next verse, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. You say, Brother Tim, is God going to call me to leave everything? Nobody's going to cause everything to be at a less priority than what it is for sure. That he'll be number one priority in. And so to speak, you're going to leave everything so he can be first. He may not call you to give up everything. He might not call you to leave everything, but I know for sure he's going to cause you to put him first to where everything else is going to have to leave that first spot. That you're going to have to definitely leave if you want the blessings that come from following him. And that's what they did. They were so overwhelmed. You say, why did that lead him to fall down like that? Do you know Romans says this? Romans says it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. Wouldn't you think it would be the punishment hand of God, the discipline hand of God? That's not what it says. It says it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. When a man sees that God's been more, what has been better to him than he deserves, has given his son to die on the cross, has done He's given him health to have a job. He's given him wisdom to be able to do well on the job. He's given him blessings financially and blessings with family and blessings with friends. And he just becomes overwhelmed that it leads him, I believe, into a state of repentance. Meaning, I just always want to be right with God because he's just good to me. And this should always lead to a close relationship with the Lord. A great orator packed out houses. And in this one particular theater, there was not a seat in the house. And he began to do all this oratory work and people were just amazed by how well he spoke and his tone and his, um, the way he, pr he pronounced his words and his great oratory ability. And he ended that presentation by quoting the 23rd Psalm, which he did by memory he did it with uh, great oratory ability. And the crowd clapped and gave him a big uh, applause. And then he told the, the, the theater people, he said, look, I, I have one person I'm going to call up. And he called this old man that was in his 90s, gray hair, former pastor, made his way up. He could barely make it. He was so frail and weak. And he asked him to stand at the pulpit and for him to recite the 23rd Psalm. And he did in a rough, gruff voice. He messed up some of his words. His tone was not well. He didn't stop at the right places to stop and uh, start up at the right places and maybe mispronounced a few words. And when he got through, there was not a dry on the house and everybody stood up and gave him a standing ovation. After that, one of the people in the audience came up to the great orator and said, what happened there? I don't understand. They gave you just an applause and you did such a great job and they did him a standing ovation. He just messed it all up. And he said, that's because I know the 23rd Psalm, but he knows the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. So you can know all about the Bible. But what we've got to do is to know the shepherd of the Bible. And that's what Peter wanted to know. He wanted to be so right with God, he fell on his face and said, I'm a sinful man, but I don't want to stay in this sinful state. He was sensitive to look in the mirror and to see his fault because he wanted to be close to God. How well are we looking at our faults? How well are we taking the blessings that God gives us and doing something with them? Maybe we have found out that Maybe we knew more about how to get a blessing than what to do with it. <laughs> is that what we'll do with a blessing from now on? Is to say, Lord, look in me. I don't deserve this. Look in me in the mirror and let me see if there's any wicked way in me. That's what David said. And then also, Lord, how can I improve my service and commitment to you because you've been too good to me? And we would be able to say, Lord, we'll leave. If you ask for it, we'll leave everything and follow you, especially whatever it is that's keeping us from following and serving you. Have we put something in front of the cart that's keeping us from being all that you've called us to be? As you stand to your feet with every head bowed and every eye closed,